Hey, kiddos, we have a job to do before we pay in gold. Can we light these candles? Hey, you get the idea? Hold the trigger. Reach up there. Got it. Good one, good one. Got another one? Look at them, stand them solemnly as we light the candles. Great. Hey, come over here. You know what I did this morning right before I left for church? I mean like 15 minutes before I left for church. I said, it's a little cold outside, so I think I want a little bit of hot chocolate. So I made some hot chocolate, and it was just, oh my goodness. On a chilly morning, hot chocolate's a good thing. And so I made it, and see, and, and I was drinking it, and I thought, oh, I should bring hot chocolate to the kids too. So, <laughs> got the old portable thermos, got a little hot chocolate, and it, one mistake thermos, hot chocolate, cup. Did you bring your cup? Did you bring a cup? Did you bring a cup? It's okay. It's okay. All right. Um, I don't think I'm sick with anything, so I'll just, we'll, we'll quaff from the beaker. We'll all have it from here. Is that all right with everybody? Whoa. I said, I'm not sick or anything. You can drink from my cup. You want to drink from my cup? You want to drink from my, you don't want to, but you didn't say no. You ready for some hot chocolate? <laughs> oh, what I hear up here that you don't hear out there. I was being polite. <laughs> I need to teach you the next, uh, the first lesson is always be polite. The second lesson is stranger danger, all right? You need to <laughs> learn that one, stranger danger, all right? No, no, but I, it's okay, because, because we can solve this problem. Um, Yeah, we'll just clean this up. Now, do you want to drink out of it? You don't want to drink out of it? You, do you want to? I mean, it's hot chocolate. Look, I can clean it up. It's kind of clean. I mean, it's, it's a lot better than it was. And this is a, you guys like this mug. This is my I Love Dayton mug. No. Still no? Why? I need a good reason from you. Because stranger danger. All right. <laughs> Quick study, mom and dad, that's good, stranger danger. But it's pretty well cleaned up on the outside, why wouldn't you drink out of it? Because it's gross, it's dirty on the inside. I mean, look at that. Ooh, that's awful. You know what? All of us, all of us, we, we, you know, we sin, we, we, we do bad things. And we can clean ourselves up on the outside like you might have, maybe this morning, maybe even today, you like had a bad attitude. Mom comes, wakes you up, and you go, hey, don't want to go to church, I don't want to wake up. You have a bad attitude. And your mom says, you're supposed to be polite to me. And so you put on the happy face, but inside, you know what's still going on? Hey, me, I don't want to go to church, I want to wake up, right, right. We can do a pretty good job of cleaning ourselves up on the outside. But it's God who has to clean us up on the inside. In, in Psalm 51, a really, really neat verse, David, who has done some, King David did some bad things. He's done some really bad things. And he comes to the point where he goes, I need God to clean me on the inside. And here's what he says. He says, create in me a clean heart. Clean me up on the inside. I can clean the outside. I can put the smile on. God doesn't clean you on the inside. Jesus is the one that cleans you on the inside. So all of this was kind of a joke. I was hoping you guys would play along and say, I'm not drinking out of your dirty cup, not even if you're polite, right? I'm not drinking out of that because that's disgusting. And I agree with you. And frankly, there isn't hot chocolate in here. There's water in there, all right? That's all there is. But I didn't lie to you on, on well, on that one I did. But on this one I didn't. I really did bring you hot chocolate but it's only hot chocolate in potential. And it's the good kind, it has the fun little marshmallows. So if you wanna go downstairs, you know, and Kelsey will help you make some hot chocolate if you like to, it has marshmallows in it, or you can take it home, doesn't matter to me. Take it home, make sure that it doesn't have a hole in it, and when you shake it up like that, it goes everywhere. All right, there you go. There you go, and let me pray with you. 
Jesus, I thank you that you can clean us on the inside. We can do a pretty good job of putting a smile on our face and cleaning the outside. That doesn't make us clean. We need you to clean us on the inside. Thank you for offering us forgiveness, chance to start over and not have bad attitudes and not say bad things. Thank you for your love and your forgiveness. And thank you, Lord, for these children. We pray in your name. Uh, last week, I had two thoughts competing for my attention last weekend. The one you know about, it was little Iris Dorothy and the birth of a granddaughter, and it was good in so many ways. The other thought that was competing for my attention you don't know about is, Friday morning a week ago, I woke up and I went, oh, oh, either I ground my teeth all night long, which sometimes I do, or I'm dealing with some uh, toothache. And by about mid-morning, I realized I hadn't been grinding my teeth. It was toothache. And so I buzzed Linda's office, and I said, um, could you call Dr. Coyne and see if you can get me in this afternoon? I got something going on on my left side. And she, uh, at lunchtime, we got together, and I said, did you call Dr. Coyne? She goes, yeah, but you and I both forgot something. He closes at noon on Friday. I'm like, that's OK. That's why, that's why they invented Tylenol. So every four hours, I'm hitting two Tylenol. I never take drugs, but I was taking them last weekend. By Friday night, um, that wasn't really taking the edge off the pain. So on the opposite four hours, I was doing what my doctor told me a long time ago, hit it with Advil. So I'm two hours Tylenol, or two Tylenol, then two Advil, two Tylenol, two Advil. This goes on. I didn't sleep a whole lot Friday night. Saturday morning, I woke up, and I was having quite a bit of pain, so I added the ice pack. I now have three treatments in my treatment plan going on, and I'm not getting a lot of relief, but my mind's also going to, I wonder how Alan and Cheryl Lynn are doing, my oldest son. So I text him, hey, any, any word from your wife? I mean, anything going on with your wife? Actually, Dad, she's been in labor all night long. It's like, oh, this is going to be the day. Um, we figured, you know, um, maybe we could get up there and be there for the birth of the baby, and then I'd be back here Sunday morning, and um, she was progressing so slowly on Saturday afternoon that I called Ron, and I said, Ron, I don't, I don't even know how to tell you what I'm going to do to you, but I need to get a mean letter from Jerry Benedict, so I'm not going to be there <laughs> on Sunday. You know I love you, right? Um, and, so, and so I bailed from church, and it's a good thing I did because we drove over to Indiana about 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night and waited there at the birthing center until in the middle of the night so we didn't sleep at all. It doesn't matter, I'm telling you. I wouldn't have slept anyway because the pain in my tooth was so bad that I was pacing. I couldn't sit still. I was ice packed the whole time, and every two hours it was this drug or that drug, this drug or that drug. We got home on Sunday. And uh, about mid-afternoon, and I said, I, I don't know what to do. I, I just, I, I got to call the dentist. And so I called the emergency number, and he said, oh, I can tell you what's going on. You have a pocket of poison in your jaw, and I'm just going to go ahead and treat it right now. And so um, let's get you to a pharmacy. We'll get you on an antibiotic. And it was, um, it was still brutal. Uh, Sunday night was really bad. I haven't taken a sick day in I don't know how many years, and I didn't go to work on Monday because I was sitting in a dentist chair for him to tell me, oh, one antibiotic won't do it, you're going to need two, and I can't do anything with that face because I look like I got hit by a softball, and it was just swollen like this, and do you remember where I started this sermon? <laughs> I had two thoughts competing for space in my brain. The one thought is the delight of the birth of a third grandchild, two in one week, and a granddaughter. The other one is a thought I couldn't get beyond because constant, horrible dental pain. Guess which one was winning that mental battle? Um, all through February, I told you this, if you have your Bible, um, Philippians chapter 4, all through February, I've been working on um, rechanging or changing how I think, recalibrating my thinking, and it all comes from Philippians chapter 4. I, in my reading, I had discovered this verse, and I went, wait a minute. Okay, I'm going to go for this. So February was my month. Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writes this. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have seen in me or heard in me, um, 
or, or, or no, I, I, I looked up. Whatever you have learned from me or received from me or heard from me or seen in me, put that into practice and the God of peace will be with you. And so I, I decided for February, I was gonna try to let God reshape my thinking in a powerful way. I was gonna think about lovely and good and pure and all those great things. I got news for you. Like a toothache, I discovered something like a toothache. There is something that relentlessly wants to rent, rent space in our brains. You know what it is? It's your past. Like a toothache, past failure steals, steals all of our attention. And it, and, and it reminds us that we are in the mess that we are in for one reason. You know what that one reason is? Us. We make messes for ourselves. And, and the truth of that is just relentless uh, running space in, in our brain. And, and I don't know if any of you are like this, um, but I, I'm willing to bet in a crowd this size, there, there are some of you that say, I have such regrets for that in my past. Really, how many years ago was that? Oh, dozens of years ago. I have such um, a sense of failure from something I said, something I did, way in my past, and like a toothache, it won't go away. If you're with me on this one, you need to go to Psalm 51. It is a powerful psalm where God is trying to rent new space in our brains to a very redemptive thought. I want to take you to Psalm 51, and I'm going to write this toothache metaphor until you have a toothache, and, and then you can go to the dentist with me on Thursday and get things taken care of. In Psalm 51, this is a, a, a powerful psalm. It starts in pain, but it ends in relief in redemption. Let me just start reading to you. I'll show you uh, the, the toothache part. Verse 1, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Now get ready for the toothache, because this is a great description. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Oh, there's the toothache. I mean, there is the toothache. Look, when you're in the middle of it, you can't say, oh, I, you know, I forgot. I have a toothache. Are you kidding me? You can think of nothing but the toothache. You can think of any, you know, I'm putting ice on it. I'm taking drugs. It's, it's just there constantly. David just said, verse 3, for I know my transgressions, and my sins are always before me. I know you guys are good Bible scholars, so you know what he's writing about in Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is about the greatest toothache in the heart of David in his entire life. It's when he was King David. It's when he saw Bathsheba and he lusted for her and he sent servants to go get her and bring her to the palace. And he essentially raped her and made her pregnant. And then he, he, he then arranged the execution of her husband, but he made it look like a, a military thing. And oh my goodness, David is caught with this and he is guilty. And God energizes his conscience to make him feel the guilt of who he is so that he writes the words, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. But you know something about David? He's a funny guy. David denied the fact that he was guilty for a long time. He just kind of stuffed his guilt until it became a raging infection inside of him and it came boiling out. I don't know if you remember how David was confronted with his sin, but David thought he had gotten away with it. And God sent the prophet Nathan to him. You remember this story? And Nathan went to him and he said, hey, David, I got to tell you a story. There was, there, there was this guy and he was really rich and he had like a hundred sheep. And his neighbor was really poor. He had one little ewe lamb. And he loved that little ewe lamb. He treated it like a pet. He, he let it run around inside his house. He even would like take naps with it and put his arm over it, kind of like Americans do with dogs. I mean, that's what it was, and it was just this little ewe lamb. And then a guest came to visit the rich man, and the rich man wanted to uh, have a feast for his guest, and so he looked around at his flock of 100 sheep, and he goes, no, I'm going to take my neighbor's one little pet lamb, and I'm going to slaughter it, and I'm going to make it into a meal, and I'm going to feed it to him. And, and, and David, Nathan said to David, how do you feel about that? And he goes, that rich guy should pay dearly. And Nathan said to him, you are that rich guy. God gave you the kingdom. God made, took you from shepherd boy, and he made you a king, and you had everything. And what did you want? 
you wanted Uriah's wife and you took her uh, as if she were your own. That is you. And David then writes Psalm 51. It is his psalm of confession. Before confession, David is in verse 3. He's in the toothache stage. For I know my transgression, my sin is always before me. But when you keep reading, you realize that, that David has to come to terms with how bad he is. And that's really in verses three, uh, four, 5 and 6. David says this, Surely I have been a sinner from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in my inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. You know something? Here's the truth. If you have pain in one tooth, it's not just one tooth that hurts. When I did get to the dentist on, uh, um, on Monday, when I was checking out, and the dentist said, you're beyond my care. you got to see somebody else next week. you got to go to a specialist for this. We'll help you with the pain. But as I was checking out and paying the bill, I was rubbing my shoulder, and the receptionist said, is the pain so bad it's down there? And I said, ma'am, it is so bad that when it hits hard, it goes up behind my left eye and all the way down my throat into my shoulder. It's a tooth. It's this big, but it radiates. You know what? David is in that stage right now. He says, it's not just that I sinned with, with Bathsheba, verse 5, he has to come to terms with who he is, not what he's done, who he is. If your sin is that you lie, what are you? A liar. If your sin is that you cheat, what are you? A cheater. You don't just come to terms with the one problem. You realize this is who you are, and that's the stage where, where David's in, and he's got to do something about it, and he tries to do what he can do. You know, me, I'm taking Tylenol. I'm taking ibuprofen. I'm slapping ice on my face. It's helping a little bit, but it's not solving the problem, and David gets to a point where he realizes, I've got to do something about this bigger than what I can do, and if you keep reading the psalm, he gets down into that stage of his recovery in verse 7. Now it's going to start to get better. L notice the verb starting in verse 7. He says to God, cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquity. And then the classic verses, verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant a willing spirit within me. Listen to me. When you are looking at what has rented space in your brain, Satan loves this one. He loves to remind you and rent space in your brain of every failure you have ever committed. The ones you can't go back and undo. Satan loves to rent space in your brain for those thoughts. It's like radiating pain. It is taking over. What God wants to do is not just erase that. God wants to do, like demolish the billboard. He wants to totally re, 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 have that thought go away and the billboard with it. And God is going to create a new heart, a new thought. Notice what happens. In verse um, 13, once the poison is out, once the sin is confessed, once the forgiveness is granted, once the blood of Jesus that we celebrate on, on Easter is shed for us, watch what happens in verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Hey, we're only on verse 14. Guess what? In verse 3, David was saying, this ache is so much a part of me. This pain is so much a part of me. It's all I can think of. But God, if you'll come in and wash me clean, if you'll come in and apply your blood to my situation, if you will create in me a clean heart, guess what I will do? I'll have something to talk about other than verse 3, my pain. I'll have something to talk about other than the failure. I'll have something to talk about. What am I talking about? I am going to talk to everybody else about, you know what? I was right where you were. I was exactly where you were. I had created a mess in my life, but guess what? 
God forgave me of that. And he didn't just wipe it clean. He demolished the billboard. And he put up a new billboard, and he goes, that's one of my kids. I don't know how Psalm 51 bumps up against you. Oh, my goodness. There are some people, and, and, and you know, I, I just love to hug them and, and let it soak in, that say, I live my life with no regrets. Give me some of that. Yeah, I'd like some of that. But the reality is, I've been living a human existence. And I do have regrets. Oh, my goodness, I look back at my past and I go, oh, my goodness, why did I do that? Can I ever tell you guys I flunked Gospel of John in my first year of Bible college? I shouldn't say that. I'll get another letter. <laughs> I flunked out of Bible college. I can't tell you how much I regret that. I can't tell you how much I regret some of the, so many of the, the failures of my past. But God doesn't trap me in the failures of my past. He goes, guess what? I can use you once your sins are confessed and forgiven. Oh my goodness, I can use you for my kingdom. And it's like, you can? <laughs> Put up a billboard to that thought. If you're struggling with the failures of the past, you need to give an eviction notice to Satan who keeps running that billboard and say, uh-uh. I'm forgiven and redeemed of my confessed sin, and God is going to use the failures of my past for kingdom business. May God add his blessing to the reading and explanation of his word.